I should Maureen, not. are you recording? I should now be recording, yes. It is, Thank yeah. You. Yes, I see it says recording up there in the corner. Yep. All right, great. Welcome everybody to the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board meeting for November 17, 2020. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the Planning Board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The Planning Board will use Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting and to allow the public to remotely attend and participate. Zoom will allow all Planning Board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. Um, so the meeting is now called to order. The first item on the agenda is uh, the minutes from our last meeting. Does anyone have any corrections or comments on the minutes? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion, please? I move we approve the minutes. Second. I have a second. Second. Discussion? Maureen, please take a roll call vote. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Shalott. Yes. The motion passes. Okay, the easy part's over. <laughs> okay, the next item on the agenda is the short-term rental amendments. Um, at the July 13th, 2020 and August 10th, 2020 meeting, the town council referred to the planning board review of uh, proposed short-term rental amendments and a request to amend the 2019 comprehensive plan recommendation number 86. Um, the planning board reviewed the short-term rental amendments and comprehensive plan revision at the August 4th and September 22nd uh, which was a special and workshop devoted just to the short-term rental amendments. Uh, October 6th and November 4th workshops as well. Public hearing was held on November 17th, 2020, at which members of the public spoke. The planning board also received correspondence from members of the public on the topic. Um, so, uh, the first item of business will be to uh, open the meeting to public hearing on the amendments. Um, and I just wanna briefly uh, go through uh, this process, which I did the first time we had the meeting on this. But uh, just for those people in attendance, we have uh, a lot of interest in this, obviously. Um, the role of the planning board is to review propo the proposed um, amendments given to us by the town council. The planning board is not a decision-making body. We are not an elected body. Uh, our role in this is purely advisory. Uh, the town council can take our um, suggestions or not. Uh, we've had a lot of good discussion on this. We've received an awful lot of letters. And um, it seems that a huge percentage of the letters are of the type or describe uh, bad behavior on the part of people renting uh, uh, houses for short term. Um, so when uh, we'd like to, I'd like to open the uh, meeting to public comment. Uh, I'd like you to focus on the zoning ordinance uh, amendments, if possible, rather than any um, experiences you've had with uh, people behaving badly in your neighborhoods. Um, uh, we will be timing. We have a three-minute time limit on uh, comment, uh, and uh, Maureen will be timing you. So. If you uh, are interested in speaking, can you please raise your hand on the, um, does everybody see how to raise their hand? Maureen, can you explain? Absolutely, so just so everybody knows, uh, if you hover on the bottom of the screen um, and you'll see something called participants, and if you click on that, 
there will come up a list of panelists and attendees uh, for everybody but the board. You wanna look under the attendees list and there will be an opportunity if you hover over your name to raise your hand. Uh, for the board's knowledge, right now we have 37 attendees at this meeting. Um, that includes Chief Fenton and uh, Co-Enforcement Officer Ben McDougall because there, there was some questions about maybe uh, enforcement type issues that you might want to address. So they are here. And right now there is one person who has their hand up. So anytime, Joe, you wanna open the public hearing, I can activate that person's microphone. Okay, so we're gonna open up the public hearing. Uh, now's your time to speak if you wish to speak and be heard. Uh, so I see uh, Jill S has a hand up, had a hand up. And her microphone should be activated now. It looks like it's muted. It looks like you're muted, Jill S. So on your own computer, Jill, there should be on the bottom, there should be on the bottom as you hover on your screen. Yep, there you go. Microphone. Sorry about that. I'm trying to drive at the same time. I just pulled into a parking lot. Good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I, I have written letters and I just want to say in this forum, um, my name is Jill Seaman. I purchased 34 Shipwreck Cove Road in Cape Elizabeth back in 2018. Um, my mother grew up in Cape Elizabeth on Mitchell Road and this house was kind of a dream come true that came up a little earlier than I planned. I still have a child in school, um, but my plan is to retire there and um, I enjoy my time there. When I went to purchase the house, it was really what helped me to be able to do it was to be able to rent it short term um, to cover my expenses, to cover the taxes. And um, the first thing I did was I found a property manager. And the second thing I did was call Ben McDougall, had him come out, look at the house. Um, I did everything that I was supposed to in order to do this properly. Um, I've also reached out to all my neighbors and introduced myself and they have my cell phone number. And I just feel like um, people who are doing the right thing really are getting hurt by this. Yes, I live in Massachusetts. Yes, I have a property manager who's on call 24 hours a day. And I just, I would hate to have to reconsider being able to have this as my retirement home because of some bad eggs and I have listened to the meetings with town council it does seem to be um, a small majority of people that are causing the problems and I get it there needs to be um, better um, rules and regulations in place and being able to monitor those and um, I think a fee the fee should be higher for the permit absolutely to help cover those charges but I don't think that limiting this to just people who are, it's their primary residence. This house is just as important to me um, as my home. Um, it is my home and it will be my home eventually, but um, I just feel like it's a very small group that are causing these problems. And I feel like um, the idea of uh, houses not being sold to people who can afford them, I haven't been able to get any real information on how many houses have sold in the last year or two that actually became rentals. I don't think it's a large amount. My house was on the market for four months. It wasn't that I, you know, swept out from under somebody else who wanted to purchase it. So I just, I, and I think that if you do limit this, you're going to have a lot of underground people. You're not going to be able to monitor it and you're going to have more issues because they're not registered. You don't know who they are and they don't have permits, so how are you going to enforce any of these rules without knowing who they are and not having it be more public? And I get it, you know, this will be my town at some point too, but I just feel like there's gotta be a better way to monitor it rather than just taking it away and then kind of making it a free for all underground. And there are other towns that have done this, but I know that there are other cities and, and towns in the country where they're now re-looking at these laws. It's specifically in Austin, Texas, um, a court ruling just said it was, I don't know if unconstitutional is the right word, but um, you know, that 
you're taking away property owners' rights. And I just feel that you are taking away our rights. You're also potentially hurting the economy of the town by all these people who go to places like Sea Salt and Alewife Farm. You know, they're not gonna travel necessarily to go to those places. So I just would hope that there'd be a little more consideration for the people who are doing it right and who also do care about the town. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody else wish to come forward and speak? Yes, there are okay. other not. All right, Let's we've see. got. Let's go with uh, Cindy. Whoops. I see. Um, okay, how about Christy Green? Christy, yes. Christy, are you there? There Christy. we go. This, there, I think you just unmuted me. Does, can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, we can. Hi. Um, so we are full-time residents of Cape Elizabeth. We live on Mitchell Road and we have three children here. Um, I just wanted to speak up a little bit and this is my first time coming to one of these meetings so I don't know how much this has been brought up before but we rent our home and have for several years now with a short-term rental permit um, during the summertime so that we can go to our summertime home and we do more than week-long rentals so we are within all of the guidelines the, the one thing of this of the sort of bullet points that we're going to be addressed tonight is the I think was it 42 days maximum is that correct or unhosted, you're talking about? Yeah, we are not here when we rent our home. We yeah. go, we go up to the up to the lake. Yeah, so it would be 42 days, correct? I believe so. Yeah, so that our only concern was with the cumbersomeness of that limitation for families like ourselves that do live here full time and rent in the summer, or you know, I know some folks that do for a few weeks in the winter over the holidays, but probably wouldn't wouldn't meet that time restriction for that reason. And who rent responsibly and have guests that are in their home for more than a week, and it's and, and neighbors are comfortable with it. That I I do feel like that forty two day restriction is is maybe a, a little. It would be cumbersome for us, and and it and it doesn't feel completely fair um, given our ability so far to host responsibly and and not have that negatively impact our neighborhood. Okay. That's all. I just want to put that you. in there. <laughs> uh, could, yeah, right. you guys. could we have an address? Sure. That's at 285 Mitchell. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Next up, Jennifer Aronson. And can you state your name and address, please? Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Aronson. I live at 27 Lawson Road. Thank and you. I've spoken at many town council meetings and ordinance meetings. And I just, I really appreciate the amendment to enforce primary residence as um, a requirement for unhosted short term rentals. Having been in a situation where I abut multiple properties that were secondary residences and being rented out for short term rentals during the summer months. Um, and having, for me, it's not even the bad behavior. It's having unknown persons constantly coming into the neighborhood, which I do think is unsafe. It doesn't make for safety for children, um, for older persons. We don't know who these people are who are coming in. And it's a lot different than when you know who everyone is. So with a primary residence, I feel like you can hold that person accountable. I'm sympathetic to people with secondary residents, but that's great if you can have a second home. We don't have a second home. And I would say 42 days for me is a way upper limit. That is almost an entire summer of having somebody having short-term rentals next door to you. Certainly you could rent it out for longer than a week. The 42 days is a short-term rental limit. Um, so those are the, I'm just reiterating things I've said in the past. I really appreciate the primary residence amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Cindy. Okay, I'm gonna have to promote Cindy to panelists because she has an older version of Zoom. Okay. Cindy, you need to unmute yourself. 
You see there the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Is it good now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you I was on Richmond Terrace, so I know there's been. Excuse me. Can you say my your last name, name is? Yes, my last name is Doucet, and I live on Richmond Terrace, where I know there have been a number of problems with short-term renters. But I've rented my house for several years and have not had any problems. Um, my neighbors have made a point of telling me that um, they're not talking about my rental when they have complaints of things that have been happening in the neighborhood. Um, I, this is my primary home and I need to be able to rent my house to prepare for retirement and 42 days to me is a very short time. That's at most half of the summer. Summer is when most people want to come to rent places in Maine. Um, and I need to find another place to live each year. And to be able to find something for 42 days is unreasonable. I wouldn't be able to get a, a reasonable rent for that amount of time. And uh, it, you know, it would just be a, a hardship. Um, I agree with, I think it was the first person who spoke that this ordinance seems to be penalizing people who have been responsibly renting. I wrote a, uh, an email today and sent it to Maureen um, to share with the planning board. And um, we, I uh, forget what I was going to say now. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, uh, I, I have, oh, I have uh, signed the um, ordinance, paid the fee, dropped it off at the town hall every year. Um, and I think that people who have signed the ordinance and ha have not had complaints from the neighbors or the police um, should be given a little more lenience, be grandfathered in to be able to rent for a little longer. Um, I uh, want to be able to stay here, and renting is part of being able to do that. And I, the other thing is, um, I know when I went to the meeting last fall, it was brought up that it was really, uh, oh, there were a, quite a few people, I think like 160, that didn't, um, register their homes for renting and and sign the ordinance and pay the fee and the town was trying to figure out how to find those people that were renting that they you know had not known about um and i think with technology and neighbors being able to report that a lot better control needs to be taken of um knowing who the people are that are renting, and if they aren't registered with the town hall, then they should be closed down. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, who else? Does anyone else have their hand up? There are no other hands up. Really? Oh, now we have two. Oh, there's a bunch. Okay. Now, we're, yeah, everyone needs to raise their hand soon. So, Elizabeth uh, O'Neill Menz. All right, Let's I will also be promoting her to panelists because she has an older version of Zoom. Okay. Can you take the uh, people off as they? I'm trying. That's done. where okay. I really are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Elizabeth, you right. should be able to speak. Sure, can you hear me? Yes, can you say your address, please? I assume that's you, that's your name. It is. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Menz, and I live at 27 Cross Hill Road. My husband, John, and I short-term rent our primary home, um, which is our own one and only home. We rent during the summer months. We began this endeavor a few years ago in order to help fund our three sons' college education. Um, I'd like to make a comment uh, regarding the proposed recommendations around that seven plus acres, um, <clears throat> which I was just a little surprised to see. Um,
Oh, I just blinked off. Okay, so first I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask uh, the council or, um, I don't know if it would be the planning board, but it would be nice to have full transparency of who or what will benefit from this proposed ordinance on this seven plus acres. I was quite disheartened to see that non-primary homeowners are receiving special treatment around this short-term rental conversation. I fully expect from the town of Cape Elizabeth to receive the same privileges as any other primary homeowner who is short-term renting. If the seven plus acre owner or entity is allowed to short-term rent for 105 days, I expect to have that same privilege. So I think I'm just going to leave it there on that comment of the seven plus acres. Um, it seems like there's uh, some special interest groups that are being um, served a little bit more privilege than the others. So that's all I have to say and thanks for taking my Okay, thank my you. I've just let uh, uh, Michael Howard. Okay. That's okay, Joe. Yep, Michael Howard, say your, uh, please say your address. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. This is Michael Howard. I'm a full-time year-round resident at 15 Rocky Point Lane, Cape Elizabeth. That is our only home. I appreciate the comments from those who feel they've played by the rules and, uh, and that their renters are not causing issues. Um, but I, uh, my position as stated in several letters that I've sent to the planning committee slash board is that um, in general, I do not understand why people feel they can run a commercial transient lodging facility in a residential area, in an area that's clearly zoned to be residential and not view that as running a business in a, in a residential area. And uh, fundamentally, I, um, you know, as I said, while I have some sympathy and for the people who've played by the rules, um, the, the purpose of zoning is to, uh, is indeed to restrict the kinds of business activities that take place in an, in an area. And in a residentially zoned area, I don't think it's appropriate to be running, uh, running, a, essentially a, a hotel. Um, I'm, there was a reference earlier made to Texas. And if you go to Texas, they don't have zoning laws. And there are other states that proudly claim that they don't have zoning laws. But people who live in areas where there are zoning laws and where there are zoning boards, um, people should, should abide by those. And uh, personally, I, I would fully support, so in the proposed amendments, there is an addendum that, that goes further uh, and does not allow unhosted and uh, uh, are steps that, are, that go beyond what the formal proposal is that is before us. Um, I would support all of those. Um, the, those I would support all of those recommendations. I, I do not believe that this goes far enough and uh, and I firmly believe that we would be much better off and that enforcement would be simpler and that, uh, and that the town would be better off and the residents of residential areas would be better off if we uh, restricted commercial activities to commercial zones and we uh, disallowed any unhosted rentals from residential zones. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Craig. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes, hi, my name is Craig Cooper. I'm a property manager here in Cape Elizabeth. And I, one of the pieces of property I manage is for Mary Giftos at Six Point Road. I've sent you several emails. Um, I believe, and I'll just state this as I've sent those emails to you, that, that the uh, information before you, the recommendations before you are casting much too wide a net to catch and 
uh, control the few problem rental areas in Cape Elizabeth. My understanding is that with, of all of the complaints uh, that have been filed, over 90%, I think it's closer to 95% uh, in basically two areas. And instead of focusing on the problem areas, the uh, recommendations are broadly sweeping and affecting many homeowners in Cape Elizabeth, rather than trying to fix the problem, you're creating problems for many people who are renting without problems, without complaints, and we're hurting many homeowners here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, that's all I have to say, thank you. Okay, thank you, Craig. All right, any other, anyone wishing to speak? Oh, I yep. see a hand. Tim Hebda. Good evening. Wait. Hello. Hi, I'm Tim Hebda, 55 Richmond Terrace. Uh, I, I want to start by thanking the planning board uh, for being quick to understand the negative impacts of STRs on our small residential communities. Uh, and, and I applaud the addendum that was added to the town council's proposed ordinance. And I encourage the town council to review that carefully. Uh, my opinion, uh, short term rentals don't hold any real value for our town. Uh, the STR properties uh, drain resources from our town's departments and they erode the peace uh, of our neighborhoods. The proposed ordinance as currently written uh, doesn't take away revenue streams. The properties can still be rented on a long term basis or in a property that is a primary residence, which is the proposal. Uh, better still, it could be a hosted rental. Uh, the proposed ordinance is currently written is, it's a compromise. And over the last 14, 15 months, it has gone through its paces. Uh, an outright ban uh, would be ideal for some, uh, but this is a compromise. Uh, still, the proposed ordinance does provide a little bit of protection for year-round residents against the negative behaviors that are coming from these uh, unstaffed hotel-like businesses that are existing in residential neighborhoods. Uh, Mrs. Doucette, who, who is a neighbor of mine, lives down on the road, and, and she does rent for longer periods of time. Uh, she rents out her primary residence, and there, there are benefits to that. And, and I appreciate the effort she puts into her rental property. Uh, the proposed ordinance is beneficial in that it's a primary resident, that is, that's, uh, the primary residency is the threshold to operate the SDR. Uh, the proposal has a limit to the number of days that an STR can operate so that those businesses aren't impacting the neighborhoods. Uh, and I also appreciate that there's language in there that all visitors to a rental property, uh, which includes friends and family, counts as activity for that unhosted STR property. Uh, so no longer can people hide under the, oh, it's my friend, or no, nah, it's my brother uh, excuse. Uh, and also the increasing of the permitting fees and the fines uh, make this a real ordinance. It sets a standard. Uh, as pointed out in the uh, consensus comments that you added in the addendum, uh, there's still some, uh, there, the ordinance still lacks some clarity around a few key issues. Uh, mainly, is this enforceable? All of this energy, all of this effort, all of this language, is it enforceable? Can uh, the code enforcement office deal with such large scale businesses in residential neighborhoods? Who's going to monitor the behavior? Is it still going to fall back to the neighbors to watch uh, how renters are acting and behaving? Uh, and, and where does the police department fit in all this? Are they willing? Uh, are they able? Uh, personally, I don't want them dealing with short-term rentals. I'd rather them focus on larger and more important issues of keeping us safe. Uh, so I do thank you all for the time and appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else out there? Well, Cindy has her hand up. Okay, she spoke already. Oh, sorry. Okay. Do you want to let her speak again? Uh, no. Okay. That's the only hand up. Okay. All right. So I'm going to close the uh, public hearing. Oh, we, we have cool. Richard. Sorry, Richard. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fine. 
Listen, um, my wife, Julia, and I, Richard and Julia Barker, we live at 4 Boathouse Lane in People's Cove. It's a very tight little community of like 24 cottages. We bought our cottage about 20 years ago after I retired and we returned to Maine to live on the coast of Maine in a lovely um, area, of course. Um, and at the time, there was only like one or two cottages that were rented maybe one or two weeks during you know early July. Of the 24 cottages, I believe now eight are rented. Um, most of the owners uh, do do a good job of trying to abide by the rules. They all do not. Um, the, the feel of the community has changed completely. Um, every Saturday, it seems, we have a new group of people coming in with their friends, um, with their neighbors, um, many from out of state. Um, and we just feel that the work that you're trying to do to limit this is a very good thing. And I realized that there are some of my neighbors, actually Jill, I think talked earlier, that you know she rents her cottage, she actually does a nice job, but one of these days when Jill wants to retire and live in her cottage, does she wanna be surrounded by you know, four or five cottages that are renting every single week. So I think what you're trying to do is very good and we appreciate it. And we hope that um, you will get support to do this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Richard. Is there anyone else? Going once. Going twice. Okay, the public comment, uh, I'm sorry, the public hearing is now closed. Um, so are there any members of the board who wish to change anything in what we've done so far after thinking about it for the past few weeks or in response to anything you've heard? Jonathan. Joe, I don't necessarily wanna um, make any changes per se, but I did just want to address one comment that was made uh, sure. in regards to this seven acres. Um, the, the request was what, what's the transparency? And I would just say that every one of our workshops, every one of our hearings that we've discussed in this case has been a public meeting. That's the transparency here. Um, we actually at the board spoke to Maureen about the seven acres and why that delineation was there. We've examined maps on which, um, properties this would affect and it's a very low number um, that this would affect. We were not approached by any group uh, who was representing or any property owner that was representing properties over seven acres that was lobbying us for this designation. Um, but the, the key thing is, is that the pattern to, uh, to me, and I think I reflect what the feelings of the board have been, is that the consistent theme on the problems with the short-term renters are the effects that it have on a neighbor. And the seven acres was sort of given because people who own seven acres or more have lots where neighbors really wouldn't be affected by a short-term rental. And that was the designation that was given. And that's why that number um, was uh, chosen. It wasn't some arbitrary number. It wasn't a request by uh, property owners who have seven plus acres asking us for that. Um, that's where that number came from. And uh, the transparency lies in from all of the workshops that have been open to the public and the meetings that have been open to the public, as well as these documents that we've worked on that have been open to the public. So I just want to make sure that's on the record uh, because it was a question that was asked of the board. But uh, we should also make clear we're on our addendum comments, we do make the statement um, the the, the uh, seven acre and also the STR adjacent appear to be fairly unfairly accommodating a select few. So I think that in our discussion, we also raised issues about the fairness of that. Um, but we did come down on the side of that they don't, these don't really generate complaints. And uh, as you said, they don't generate complaints from neighbors. Um, 
anything else? Andrew. No, I, I was thinking about one thing the other day about um, uh, how, how people running short-term rentals are reporting um, how many basically nights or, or how much activity there's been in a year. Um, I was trying to think about, you know, how it could be easier for enforcement to kind of keep on top of things. And I, uh, I couldn't remember exactly. I knew there was some, some thing in the ordinance about um, keeping track of all that. Um, and I'm just, I just looked it up now. But I, I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me. Is it somewhere in here? And I, I can't remember. I couldn't find it. That, that, that sort of record needs to be submitted annually to the, to the town, Maureen? Or Maureen. So there's no requirement that it be submitted to the town, but there is a, a requirement on page eight, right in the middle of the page, right. that it be provided upon request within five days. And I'm sure he's going to be thrilled for me to remind you that uh, Ben McDougall is here tonight in case you want to talk to him directly about enforcement questions, as well as the police chief. I was just wondering if, if it didn't make sense actually for there be, to be something to be provided on um, a monthly or a bi-monthly basis or something for people who have short-term rentals, basically tracking this activity. Maybe there's an online track, tracking um, record or something as a way for it to be easier for code enforcement to basically know like, you know, if somebody's gotten a complaint, they, hey, there's Bob's in short-term rental again, I think he's beyond the, the period that they're supposed to, that they have an easy way to just look it up rather than, you know, requesting it. It might keep people a little more honest too, in my opinion, but. All right, Carol Ann had her hand up. Let me, I would, I actually, just before you speak, I would like to hear from Ben on um, the reality and difficulty of enforcement of this. Uh, of these regulations that are being proposed. Um, so go ahead, Carol Ann. Okay. Uh, all I'm going to say is the addendum is our, as we've read through this and we've worked through this, our recommendations. And what Andrew said sounds like another recommendation from the planning board for consideration by the council to look at some sort of regular reporting by the people who are doing short-term rentals to make that available on a regular basis. And I would just add it to our addendum. If everybody, if there's a consensus that uh, it makes sense. Um, Pete? Uh, yeah, a slightly different point. Um, a number of the folks who spoke uh, did make a point. They, they worked very hard to have good short-term rental situations and were successful and resented the fact that those who didn't were taking something from them. And one of the, um, one of the obvious um, responses to that problem is to let people do it and then throw the book at them if they, if they misbehave or if they, if they don't enforce good behavior. The big problem with that, and I, I say this just my own perspective on the board, is that once you create a right, to take that away requires something we call due process of law. And you can't just, if somebody has a wild party one weekend and, and you know, disrupts the neighborhood, you just can't run out and, and snatch away their right to rent their properties. It builds in a process that has to be followed to take, these, to take this permit from them, if you will. And this, this is part of the problem in this whole ordinance that it's a very complex ordinance. And the more complex it gets, uh, as you take people's rights away from them, you're going to have to follow a fairly elaborate process. And that's one of the things that's troubled me about this thing from, from day one. Uh, we're a small town. We have a small enforcement staff. Ben, on, on the civil side and the small police force and the other, I, I really think we should focus and try very hard to simplify this thing as much as possible and not get ourselves tied up in knots on withdrawing people's rights to rent. Thank you. Okay. So, Ben, uh, Maureen. Yeah, I, I want to make sure Ben has an opportunity to respond because 
Um, I don't think his office can stand a lot more paper. But <laughs> okay. Well, that's where we were. I was about to go. So Ben, you can uh, undo your mic, or Maureen, can you? He's there. I'm, I'm here. So Ben, what is the uh, how easy or difficult would the set of uh, ordinances be to enforce on your part? Well, it's it's much more enforceable than the existing ordinance, but at the same time, this this is something that's difficult to enforce. We do rely on neighbor complaints in order to do enforcement. Uh, we 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 have uh, Hamari is helping me with enforcement now so that's going to help significantly and uh so overall we're going to be in a much better spot next year than we have been in past years but it's it's still a complex thing to enforce that relies on neighbors help when, and they don't always want to help and i understand that point um and also to what to what peter said I also see some complexities when when the rubber hits the road and, and we have some real enforcement issues and it's not just, you know, 95% of the time I go around and talk to people and people comply. 5% of the time, you know, people lawyer up and I do think this will get very complex in, in those situations. Um. What kind of time commitment do you see in terms of uh, like you, you're the amount of time you would spend on this versus your uh, actual code off, off enforcement duties? Uh, in, in the summer, it, it, really, it, it really hinders my, my duties in the summer. I typically come in on Monday mornings and uh, I already have a full schedule on Monday morning and then, you know, I'll have five, six, seven emails about short-term mental activities that occurred over the weekend. And, uh, and, and those neighbors expect quick responses and, and I don't blame them, but the reality of my job is I'm, I, unless I just no longer do building permits and building inspections on Mondays in the summer and dedicate it to short-term rentals, then uh, I, I get to those complaints, you know, typically Monday afternoon or sometimes Tuesday or Wednesday if I'm super busy, you know, summer is also the busiest time for building. And so I guess to answer your question, it, it, it could be upwards of, eight or 10 hours a week, sometimes. Okay, does anyone else have any questions for Ben? Jim, Mike. Yep, uh, Ben, do you see yourself hiring more people than what you already have? Is that even an option? I do. I think as, as a town, we're getting close to that. Uh, with the state building codes, uh, we, we're getting, we're, we're, we're being mandated to enforce more. We're about to get uh, a new mechanical code adopted. And, uh, and, the, and there's new codes uh, adopted every year. So I'm, I'm starting to get over my head. And I think uh, in, in the next year or two, I wouldn't be surprised if Cape Elizabeth has an assistant code officer. And that would have to be funded, uh, you know, in some part by increased short term rental fees, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, thank you, Ben. You're welcome. I'll, I'll hang out. Um, and Maureen, you said we have a police chief online here? Yes, let me bring him forward as well. Okay.
<laughs> ben has an assistant already. I saw him. There we go. Okay. So I'll ask you the same question. What, uh, how do you think this proposed um, ordinance would affect your duties and workload? You know, w the police department, we're always here and willing to help. We, we fall into that one town concept where we're gonna give a hand to anybody that we can, but I also understand we're, we're, we're spread pretty thin. And especially as this ordinance becomes more complex, um, expecting officers to know all the nuances. We got to be uh, the de facto experts in a lot of areas. So this is, um, you know, we're getting a little bit deep for us. But you know, if Ben's unavailable at night, we're still willing to be the eyes and the ears and document and report back to him. Um, that's kind of our, our our position here. Okay. Any questions? No. All right. Great. Well, thank you. I just want to say, hey, uh, Chief Fenton, you wrote a very good letter, I guess probably a year ago, and that pretty much sums things up. And I just want to let you know that was a very good letter. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. So moving on. Um, do we want to take up Andrew's uh, suggestion? And add that to the addendum. Could you restate it, Joe, as to what it was? <laughs> Hold on. I just saw you know, turn on Ben's microphone a second. Uh, re regarding the mandatory reporting, uh, I I don't support that uh, because I think it'll it'll be much more complex for me because then I, I have to manage all of these documents and make sure people submit all of these documents. And if people don't submit the documents, I'm gonna be chasing the people on a monthly basis to submit their documents. And uh, it's, it's just a lot more work and a lot more file space for me to manage those documents. I, it's, a, it's a good idea in concept if, uh, if I had another body in my office to manage these documents, but under my current situation, it would uh, it would just be difficult to chase these documents and manage these documents. All right, so I'd vote to leave it off for now. I don't know how you all feel, but I agree. Okay, so Maureen, what's our next step? Does somebody need to make a motion to move this Go back? To can I say one more thing before that? Um, yes. I, when we first were tasked with this, I think our approach is very much what was said earlier. And I just want to reiterate that, that um, we looked at this as an advisory uh, for the zoning laws and policy comes from the town councils. So if people don't like this decision or are in support of this decision, either way, this is not the final say and they should be taking their opinions to the town council, which is the next step uh, to make sure that whatever policy is adopted by the town, uh, that those people's voices either in support or in opposition of it are heard. Thank you. Do we want to go over, hey Joe, do you want to go over the, our, that addend, uh, the attachment to the ordinance? Are you going to go through that at all? Oh, yeah. so, I think it, does anyone have um, anything to add to it? No, I don't. No, I read through it, and I, I think it got captured all the discussion. Yeah, I feel like it captured yep. everything that we discussed. Okay. So, Maureen. So. Yes. Just just so it doesn't get lost, because um, we want to make sure that whatever the council adopts has a strong legal basis in case there's any challenge. Uh, there's two things that are in front of you tonight. One is to amend recommendation number 86, and that's on the last page of that cover memo, and that should be a separate vote 
from the second motion, which is whether or not you recommend the amendments to the council. Okay. So two different votes. Okay. Thank All you. All right, so we need someone to make the first motion. You ready? I'll Me. do it. Carol Ann. The planning board recommends that the 2019 comprehensive plan be revised to replace recommendation number 86 with the following. Restrict short-term rentals, STR, to protect the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of neighborhoods and preserve housing stock. Limited STR activity associated with primary residency or in lower density portions of town may be allowed within a permit structure that allows tracking of activity and funding for enforcement. Do you have a second? Second. Um, any discussion? Yep. Maureen, no. take the roll call, please. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Chair Shalott? Yes. Motion passes. Can I have a motion uh, for the short-term short rental amendment recommendation, please? I'll do that one too. Thank we you. had ordered that based on the facts and the information presented, the planning board recommends the short-term rental amendments to the town council for consideration. Second. Second. Uh, discussion. Maureen, please take a roll call. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Chair Shalott. Yes. Motion passes. Make sure we're awake. Yeah. <laughs> that was like when Mrs. Gray would go the opposite way home on bus three back. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. First. <laughs> um. So moving on to the next item, should we give everybody a chance to clear out here? Who doesn't? It's done. Is Pete Benton going to stay for this one? Is what? Oh, are Pete and, uh, sorry, Paul and Ben, are you staying for this? Next one. Okay. All right, item number two, Town of Cape Elizabeth Communications Tower. The Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting site plan review of a new 180-foot tall public safety telecommunications tower and a 16-foot by 11-and-a-half-foot support building to be located at 8 Denison Drive. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 199 site plan regulations in section 19812 tower antenna performance standards. Um, I just want to point out that the uh, planning board conducted a public site walk on Thursday, October 27th of the site. Um, and uh, so we can begin by having the applicant summarize any uh, changes made to the plan since our last meeting. And I don't know if Matt, you want to begin by speaking or Steve Harding. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the planning board. Good evening and uh, thank you for taking this up this evening. Uh, we're here tonight seeking site plan approval for a new communications tower to be located at 8 Denison Drive, as the chair noted. Uh, this property and uh, this project was originally introduced to the board on September 1st uh, by a workshop. And as the chairman just stated uh, via the uh, site visit, which was held on October 27th. During both the workshop and the site visit, comments and recommendations were received regarding the project, and our submittals for this evening have worked to, to address any identified issues and answered any questions. This project will be a critical improvement to our public safety and our public works infrastructure, uh, enabling the town to better serve the residents of Cape Elizabeth and to improve our ability uh, to protect the public safety, health, and welfare of the residents of the town. Finally, Steve Harding of Sebago Technics is here to present the technical details of the project, 
the Chief Gleason, Chief Fenton, Public Works Director Jay Reynolds are also available as well as myself if needed. And thank you again for your service and for your review of this project. And I'll step aside so Steve can uh, talk about the important parts of this project. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Um, good evening. Uh, uh, as Matt said, uh, we've uh, been before you uh, a couple of times already to talk about this project. So we'll go into great detail of the project's parameters. Uh, just try to talk a little bit about the information that we provided to you uh, beyond uh, the last meeting. And Excuse me, Steve. Do you need yes. Maureen to put up uh, any material? Um, Do you want to host, Steve? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Steve is actually very good at hosting. We, we yes, now set me up. <laughs> <laughs> set me up to fail. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Just a second here. I'm hoping that you folks can see a plan now. Let's give it a bit. Not yet. Hmm. Did you go down to the bottom where it said screen share? The green yeah. arrow? I thought I did. Uh, let me uh, go back here. I apparently didn't. Maureen, you did it. I know, it's my fault. I'm sorry. Uh, it's all Maureen's fault. It's not my fault. That's right. Well, I've, Steve has uh, shown me other plans and he's got a lot of other cool tools that I don't have, so. Yeah. Ah. There that, we go. Is okay. that better? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. About that. Um, some of the information that we provided from the last meeting, we did uh, provide you a memo. Uh, actually, Matt provided a memo on the uh, co-location matter. Again, we're putting uh, the public works, the fire department, and uh, the police department on the same tower. So those are all collated. Uh, we've also uh, made provisions uh, with the 180 foot tower that uh, there would be other spaces available. And on this plan, um, I'm gonna move you folks over here. Um, we have these areas designated for future, um, for future uh, location uh, or building support buildings for uh, co-locators. So that, uh, that part is uh, underway. Um, we have been talking to the DEP. We've got an arrangement with them. Uh, it's kind of a long story, but this area of the transfer station would be uh, included into the DEP site law for the public works facility parcel. And then we'll be eligible for an exemption of that site law standard because the project's so small, uh, it has less than 10,000 square feet of disturbed, unrevegetated area. So we'll uh, qualify for an exemption of that. So that's how we'll move forward uh, with the DEP piece. Um, we've also addressed many of, uh, um, all of Todd Gammons, uh, he's a peer reviewer for Blaze Engineering that provided comments to the last planning board meeting. Uh, a number of his comments have been addressed uh, through uh, the grading of the site. Um, oops. If you recall, um, we brought up this uh, compound area and raised the elevation of the road slightly coming in here. So we have more of a fill situation, trying to avoid uh, ledge removal. And another step to avoid ledge removal, we originally had proposed to come underground from this utility pole, this existing utility pole, and bring our end uh, underground to this transformer pad. Now we're going overhead uh, to that pole and then to the another pole and dropping down into the transformer pad. And then we're providing bollards around the transformer pad to protect it uh, if there's any plow activity uh, happening there. Uh, a couple other comments that Todd had uh, that we uh, worked on and changed. Uh, we have the building shown here. Um, we also have uh, the tower and uh, the connections to it. Uh, this is the generator pad that was part of the original uh, submission that we did, but it, we just changed the configuration through here. Um, a couple of the other changes that we made, um, sorry, I think that actually uh, 
couple of the comments that Todd had provided you folks for tonight. Uh, one was the first floor elevation of the building itself, and we've provided that here. Um, it's about four inches above the uh, surrounding area that um, the compound would be, so it sets up a little bit higher. And then the other point that Todd made, uh, and I'm going to back up into this one, uh, one is uh, there was some confusion as to what the surface of this material be and how far it would extend past the uh, uh, fence line. Uh, we've clarified that. We've added a note, if I can find it. Um, right at the bottom. Yeah, right bottom at the right. bottom down here. Extend the crushed stone area one foot beyond the chain link fence. We've added some dimensions as well, 60 feet and 60 feet to define the, the fenced area. And then uh, we don't, I don't have the detail in front of me right now, but there was some confusion on our detail of this area. We had used a, a gravel mix or that, uh, that our um, geotechnical was in the geotechnical report. I spoken to SW Cole today. Um, we talked about the project and we want to go to a, a more uniform crushed stone uh, layering here, and that will uh, help us with the stormwater and also provide a, a firm surface. And uh, they were fine with that. The spec they provided was more for a gravel area that you might plow, which given the fence and the constraints in here, certainly we wouldn't be plowing that, that surface. Um, we also um, provided, and I'm going to try to pull it up. Um, these are the coverage plans that we had. I actually tried to show you, uh, I think one time and they just weren't behaving. Uh, essentially, these are the uh, coverage of the, the signal strength from the tower. The, and the, the way it works, the closer you get to zero in this, this uh, categories over here, the better off you are. This is in your packet. These three colors are considered uh, strong signals. The lighter, uh, I guess I'll call that purple and pink, and the dark here, which would be this area, um, that, those are poor coverage areas. Uh, this is the existing uh, signal from, uh, this is the, uh, from uh, the bottle shed uh, tower. You can see right around the tower, it's pretty good. And then through here, but we've got some really light areas along the uh, Eastern coastline. And then we've also got, this is the police station tower. This is off Bowery Beach Road. Um, it's, it's uh, again, good coverage around it, close to it, a little bit better coverage over here. But again, we're really light coverage are along the coastline, which is where a lot of the problems with communication have been happening. So this is a projection of what the future power would be, again, from the public, uh, from the transfer station facility, get a much broader range of this darker color, the blue, uh, again, good coverage. You do still have some some lighter areas, but much more much more better and uniform coverage there. So that would uh, definitely prove that you know this this tower is going to be improvement on on what we have today. And then the other uh, piece of information that we've provided is uh, again we these photos were ones we showed you at the last meeting. Um, we provided you this preliminary non-interference letter from uh, Mark Davis, who's the town's uh, communications uh, consultant and basically uh, going uh, saying that there, there shouldn't be any uh, interference issues with uh, the new tower. Uh, anecdotally, you know, the, the public works department has been on the bottle shed for quite some time. Uh, I think the fire department joined them a few years ago. Prior to that, they were uh, on the Strout, Strout Towers. Um, there were no interference issues, you know, or haven't been. Uh, so, you know, Mark feels quite confident that uh, there won't be any going forward and of over 99% sure, I know it can be positive 100%, but he feels like that very strongly that this is, is not going to cause an interference problem. And one of Maureen's, uh, one of the proposed conditions in the staff memo had to do with the communications tower and providing this information up front from a PE and um, it's very awkward to do it at this stage. So we proposed some uh, alternate language that I think Maureen shared with you today that would uh, uh, provide for that being provided if there was a written uh, notice to the town of, a, of an interference problem. Um, I think that's all I had to 
to go by uh, or to bring up. Uh, certainly would be available with the rest of the team to answer any questions you might have. Okay, uh, so um, I'm going to open the uh, meeting up to a public hearing. Um, is there anybody who wishes to make a comment? Uh, now would be the time to raise your hand. Uh, I see no hands yet. Anybody wish to make a comment on this? Okay, seeing no one, the uh, public hearing session is closed. Um, let me just get back my picture of the board members. There we go. Okay, so uh, planning board members, any comments, questions? I Andrew? Yeah, I just had a question. Uh, certainly there's been planning and thought about co-location of, of other, for other users on site. You've got the two pads and whatnot. I'm just wondering, um, not knowing anything about, or, or very minimal about wireless communications, if, if this was vetted through other wireless um, companies just to make sure that it, that it could support other equipment. I, I don't even know what that would be, if, whether it be cellular technology or 5G or something, just to make sure that what's being put there actually could have co-located equipment fully. And then sort of further to that, if there was, um, you know, most of these wireless companies, I think use fiber connections and things. So to make sure that, you know, this site could actually support fiber if there was fiber at the street or whatever. That, that was my question. Uh, I, I can take a first pass at it, but I, I'll probably defer to the fire chiefs that have, have more conversations than I have had uh, on this. But, uh, you know, it, it's a 180 foot tower. So space wise, we should have available space to do that. I don't believe uh, other wireless companies have looked at this specifically. Um, I don't think the project has evolved that far. We're certainly providing for, you know, space for uh, future co-locators if, if one becomes available or if one uh, ident is identified. Uh, we certainly want to provide that, that flexibility, but I don't think that, you know, the plan specifically has, has gone through a vetting process um, through that, through, through any other wireless companies and invite the fire chief or anybody else on the team that would like to, to speak on it. To, to go ahead. Steve, uh, the, uh, to my knowledge, there's no uh, fiber optic on Sperling, but certainly the tower or the facility could accommodate fiber optic. We've had some conversations with the tech department about uh, fiber because there is fiber to the uh, DBW facility. Uh, so it, we use, would use fiber as a backup to our radio uh, direct communications with Portland. Um, and to my knowledge, no one has. Uh, Express any interest in locating on the tower it certainly could accommodate the 180 foot is the standard uh, height for a tower. I would have to show that we would provide better coverage than where those companies are located now before they'd express much of an interest. Okay, Jonathan, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say I appreciate the um, inclusion. Uh, with the new information about the uh, the signal range, because uh, to me that's the most important um, aspect of the necessity for this tower, um, so that the fire department, the police department, uh, public works has more um, more access to, to their people to get that signal out there for public safety considerations. So I appreciate you putting that in. All right, any other questions or comments? Yeah, uh, do this, Dan. Uh, Steve, great project. A uh, question about the generator, uh, I guess the, the pad and the generator size, is that just sized for the town's equipment? And if a coal, you know, future collator showed up, would they add a, you know, their own, their own generators or do you not know? Um, I, I know that, you know, uh, the fire chief has worked with Mark Davis, who again is a communications uh, consultant for the town, and that Mark had given us that generator information, and we had provided the 
the uh, specifics on it in the first submission uh, regarding noise and its size and capacity. Uh, my sense is it probably would be able to uh, support other uh, needs, but I honestly don't know that for a fact. Uh, I'm not sure, again, if, if Chief Gleason can, uh, can enlighten us further on that. It certainly has capacity to do more than we're going to demand of it, Steve, but my experience with the other tower location was those companies all had their own individual generators for whatever reason. Okay, thank you. All right, any final comments or questions? Would someone care to make a motion? I will. Okay. You got a motion for the board to consider findings of fact the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting site plan review of a new 108 foot tall public safety telecommunications tower and 16 foot by 11 and a half foot support building to be located at 8 Denison Drive, R05 10, which requires review under section 19 9 site plan regulations and section 19 8 12 tower and antenna performance standards. Two, the planning board deemed the application complete on October 20th, 2020, conducted a site visit on October 27th, 2020 at 5.15 p.m. and held a public hearing on November 17th, 2020. Three, the plan for the development reflects the natural capabilities of the site to support the development. Four, the access to the development will be on roads with adequate capacity to support the traffic generated by the development. Access into and within the site will not will be safe. Parking will be provided in accordance with section 19-7-8 off-street parking. Five, the plan preserves an existing system of pedestrian ways within the development. Six, the plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. Seven, the development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted. Eight, the development does not require an adequate quantity and quality of potable water or sanitary waste disposal. I'm assuming that's correct. We're not, we're not running any water up there, right, Steve? That's correct. Um, nine, the development will be provided with access to utilities. Ten, the development will not locate, store, or discharge materials harmful to surface or groundwaters. Eleven. The development will provide for adequate disposal of solid waste at the adjacent recycling center. 12, the development will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of any adjacent water body. 13, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 14, the development will provide for adequate exterior lighting without excessive illumination. 15, the development will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site and screening is needed. 16, the development will not substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. 17, no storage of exterior materials on the site are proposed. 18, the proposed tower is needed by the police, fire and public works departments to provide for public health and safety and will provide co-location opportunities. Eight, uh, 19, the proposed tower will be constructed in a color intended to blend into the surrounding environment. 20, the proposed tower will be adequately buffered by existing woodlands surrounding the site. Oops, skip to page. 21, no lighting of the tower is proposed. 22, the proposed tower will be constructed to the current ANSI slash EIA slash TIA 222 revision F standard. 23, the proposed tower base will be enclosed with an eight foot high fence topped with three strands of barbed wire. 24, no advertising is proposed on the tower. 25, the proposed tower will not interfere with the radio, television, or telecommunication service enjoyed by the community. And that's anecdotal as I understand it, Steve, and you're gonna verify if there are problems yeah basically you know we've gone through and and looked at an assessment um mark davis who's the uh 
the uh, communications consultant for the town has looked at it. The, the public works and public facilities use different uh, frequencies than the wireless, so there shouldn't be any problem. But if there is a problem, we will look into it and address it. Hey, Joseph, should I add a sentence to that? That um, the proposed, um, uh, what do I want to say? Do I, do I, should I say that, or are we just going to wait to see if there's problems? There was something in the conditions. Yeah. Where is there? I can't remember. Okay, there's never mind. Never mind. Thank you, Carol Ann. 26, the proposed tower is located on town property and it will be the responsibility of the town to remove it upon cessation of operations. 27, no performance guarantee is needed because the town is responsible for compliance with town regulations. Uh, 28, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-8-12 tower and antenna performance standards. Therefore, be it ordered that Based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of 180 foot public safety telecommunications tower to be located at 8 Denison Drive be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer, Todd Gammon's letter dated November 10th, 2020. Two, that a note be added to the plan as follows. A final certified statement of non-interference shall be provided by a professional engineer and approved by the town prior to the issuance of a building permit and the engineer shall be licensed to practice in the state. Three, there, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of a building permit until the plans are revised to address the above conditions and submitted to the town planner. Second. Awesome, do I have, is there any comment? Excuse me, Joe. Um, could I make a comment? Yes. Um, we had offered some alternate language for condition number two. Uh, again, it's a difficult uh, condition to meet at this time before the tower is up and operational. And we'll, yeah. we'll I, as a final Steve, I know you stated that when, when your presentation. I'm sorry, I did not get a chance to read the 40 odd emails between 6.30 and quarter or seven. So, uh, What's the information and what's the alternate language? Uh, the alternate language that we proposed Steve, was. Steve, oh, sorry. if you can give me back hosting duties, I can put the, the alternate motion on the screen. And I did read that motion when Steve sent it and I agree with it. Well, can we all hear it? <laughs> so Steve, can you make me host? I, You're working uh, on it? Yeah. Okay. Usually, if you go to my name and just say make her host. Okay, I am now the host. Just give me a moment. Can you all see that now? Yeah, I like it. Yeah. So if if the person who made the motion could agree to the amendment and the person who seconded could agree to the moment the amendment. I agree. I agree. Great. Um, okay, so we have a second. We have the uh, modification of the motion. Uh, Maureen, please take a roll call. Sure. Uh, Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Peter, microphone. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Shalott. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, you all so very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda: the Magnolia Terrace Private Road and uh, RP permit. 
Christopher Carey is requesting private road review of Magnolia Terrace and a resource protection permit to fill 3,550 square feet of RP2 wetland to construct 377 feet plus or minus of private road to create frontage for a new lot located at 4 Alexander Drive. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1979, private road review and section 1983, resource protection permit regulations. Um, so who's here uh, to present the project? Julia, John? Yeah, one of them. You can undo your mic and start speaking. Yes, uh, John is planning to present, but I was going to flip through the slides as he presents. Okay, sounds good. I'm here. Hi, John. Okay. So, um, um, so hold on. So uh, you need to give Julia hosting, right? right. Yes, exactly. Okay. All set? Yep. Yeah, we are set. Okay, uh, so my name is John, John Mitchell, and as you know, Julia is um, with, with us. And I believe Chris and Billy Carey uh, have joined the meeting as well. They're the applicants. Um, so the, um, I wanna just quickly review some of the existing conditions of this project um, before we get into our proposal. Uh, the, this is a, um, copy of the existing conditions plan. It's a 10.7 acre parcel of land off of Eastman Road, um, very close, uh, diagonally across from Eastern Meadows. And um, the current owner is uh, Chris and Mary Ann Carey, who resides in the um, uh, the residents in the rear of the property in this location. Um, it is in the residential A district and resource protection district. The access road coming in is Alexander Drive, uh, coming in from Eastman Road. Um, it extends approximately 400 feet before taking a 90 degree turn. Now, um, at the end of Alexander Drive, um, in this location here, is a driveway, a paved driveway that provides access to the Cary residence. Uh, the, the, um, other than the lawn area surrounding the Cary residence, the entire parcel is wooded with uh, predominantly um, young growth hardwood trees with some white pine scattered throughout the property. It drains, it slopes and drains in a northwesterly direction towards the, uh, the top of the plan. Um, wetlands have been delineated. Um, they were delineated by statewide surveys in the month of September of this year. Um, there are RP1 and RP2 wetlands. Um, basically, there are three pockets of RP2 wetland. There's a small pocket um, in this location, just uh, west of the Alexander Drive. There is a narrow um, RP2 wetland that goes bisects the middle of the property and slopes uh, into this area. And then there is a, uh, a very thin, um, layer of RP2 wetland 
on the southerly side of the existing driveway. Um, and this wetland, um, I, I did want to mention that on this, yeah, go to sheet two, Julia. Um, this is a previous wetland delineation that was prepared by Sebago Technics in 1998 when the land was, um, when the land was subdivided. And uh, there is no wetland shown um, in this area here. Um, so when uh, Dale uh, Brewer, you can go back to sheet one. When Dale Brewer uh, delineated the wetlands, he did determine that there is a, um, a narrow, a very narrow ribbon of RP2 wetland there. Now the, the thought is that when they installed the driveway, uh, that it acted more or less like a dam. And over time, the RP2 wetland um, has, has formed. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, that, um, that uh, it's possibly a man-made wetland. Um, and then the RP1 wetland is this area at the northwest corner of the property, as well as this large low-lying area here. Um, in terms of utilities, there is a eight-inch public water main out on uh, Eastman Road. Um, sanitary sewer will be providing uh, a on-site wastewater disposal system. And electric telephone and cable um, go underground from Eastman Road all the way down to a transformer located in this area here. Um, so that's a quick overview of uh, some of the uh, existing conditions. Now, if we go to sheet three, um, this is <clears throat> an overall site plan of the property showing the proposed access road. Um, I, sh I should say private road, it's a private road. Um, and it shows the division of the property um, into two lots, lot one and lot two. Uh, lot one is the existing uh, residence of um, the Carries, and then lot two is the proposed lot um, in the building envelope. It's hard to see, but the building envelope is right in this location here. Uh, Magnolia Terrace, um, as I said, it's, it's designed as a private road, um, 18 feet wide, consisting of uh, a 14 foot wide travel way and with two foot uh, wide gravel grass shoulders on either side. Um, we met with uh, Chief Gleason um, uh, in the beginning of, of the design for the project and uh, we reviewed uh, some of the some of the site constraints and uh, there were a couple things that uh, Chief Gleason requested. One is a uh, turnaround, an emergency vehicle turnaround, which is right in this location. And the second thing is a um, um, a residential fire uh, spring, uh, sprinkle system, I should say, sprinkle system. Um, and the carries have agreed to install that in their new home. Um, if we go to sheet four, Julia, which is the, um, which is the layout and utility plan. So the top uh, plan is the uh, layout plan, and you can see that beginning at um, beginning at Alexander Drive, we're coming in. We're more or less following the existing driveway to around this point here, and then we start to deviate. Um, we, we're the the existing driveway is this dash line here, so you can see that we've deviated slightly. Um, and then we're rejoining the existing driveway in this location here. 
And the reason that we're doing this, the reason for the, uh, the deviation is so that we can create a usable building envelope. Uh, we have a number of constraints. Um, we have a 40-foot right-of-way uh, line um, along, El uh, along Magnolia Terrace. Uh, we have 30-foot wide uh, front setback and side setback. We have a 25-foot setback to the RP2 wetland. And then we have the 250-foot uh, the setback uh, to the RP1 um, wetland. So that is, it was really the only way that we could create a usable building envelope. Um, so that was, that was the purpose for the, the curvilinear alignment in the roadway. Um, the bottom plan is the utility plan. Uh, we're bringing in a two inch service, uh, water service along the shoulder of Alexander Drive and Magnolia Terrace to the, uh, to the house lot. Um, this area right here is the, um, the on-site wastewater disposal system. We've had Al Frick, Albert Frick Associates out to test the soils and they tested suitable for a um, uh, disposal system. And then the telephone, um, electric telephone and cable will come from the existing transformer, which is right in this corner of the lot and will uh, be serviced uh, into the residence. A um, sheet five. Um, sheet five, this is the grading and drainage plan and the road profile. So as you can see, um, the roadway has been designed with a crown in the middle sloping to either um, direct, other side, uh, either side of the roadway. Uh, we've collected the, the runoff uh, through a drainage swale on the southerly side. We're installing a new 12 inch culvert, which will direct the water into a proposed rain garden located in this area here. This is a um, uh, mostly open area. Uh, there's not a lot of tree growth in this area. In fact, there's a photograph in the application booklet uh, that shows um, this area specifically. Uh, but the rain garden will be designed to accommodate uh, the impervious surface of the roadway and the turnaround. Um, and then uh, it will accommodate the, the first inch of, of rainfall. The rain will infiltrate down through the rain garden during uh, large storm events, there will be a, um, an outlet on this end here, which will allow the flow to drain its natural course. All right, uh, sheet six, please. Um, this is the erosion control plan. Um, and down on the lower left, we've uh, prepared a wetland impact uh, plan which shows the actual impact of the um, of the RP2 wetland, which is show, shown in a bold line. <coughs> um, we have uh, contacted DEP, and uh, DEP has said that we don't need a permit in this case because it is under their threshold of 4,300 square feet. Um, we have also contacted uh, the Army Corps of Engineers um, and we have submitted a um, self-verification notice form along with um, a lot of the attachments that they require. Um, I, I spoke with Army Corps of Engineers uh, this morning. Uh, they are in receipt of the application and they essentially have given me verbal approval on it. Um, they have to wait 30 days uh, because of the other agencies. Uh, I have to, uh, I guess it's Inland Fisheries and Wildlife takes 30 days to review the application. Um, and then I understand that the Conservation Commission has also reviewed uh, the wetland impact and have approved uh, this proposal. 
And um, let's see. Uh, I think that is, oh, there was one thing I wanted to mention. Julia, if you go back to uh, sheet three, I believe. Uh, uh, yeah, that one. I don't know, I'm sorry, four. Um, one, of, one of Steve Harding's comments was to um, reach out to uh, Chief Fenton and to, um, to meet on site and talk about a potential stop sign at the, at the intersection, at this intersection, which we have done. In fact, we did it yesterday. We met with Chief Fenton and uh, the Public Works Director. And uh, I, I guess the consensus was that um, a stop sign in this situation was not appropriate uh, because of the low back volume of traffic but rather to um, install a yield sign um, for uh, Magnolia Terrace. So we've agreed to do that. We're gonna have a, uh, a road sign located in this area here for, <clears throat> for Magnolia Terrace. And we will also mount a yield sign facing towards Magnolia Terrace. Um, and we also met with uh, as I said, uh, the public works director to talk about monumentation and he has agreed to the waiver um, uh, to replace the granite monuments with iron pins. Um, let's see. The, uh, yeah, the last thing was um, the waivers, which we have talked, we reviewed with the planning board, a lot of the waivers um, that we're requesting at the workshop meeting. Um, the under submission requirements, there's the traffic study, uh, which with one additional lot, we didn't feel that that was um, necessary. Um, completing a, a, uh, design, a final design for the, uh, for the septic system um, by not issuing an HHE 200 form, um, which will become part of the uh, building permit application. And then uh, stormwater calculations uh, with the relatively small increase um, in impervious surface. Uh, we are requesting a waiver on the, not the stormwater management plan, but the calculations. And then under road design standards, uh, we have, we talked about the road width uh, being narrower than the 22 foot wide uh, required road for a private road. Um, and this basically, uh, because we're only adding one additional lot um, that we wanted to try to minimize the overall impact of the wooded area um, and maintain the, the character of what's out there now. Um, uh, side slopes, I believe that Steve Harding has approved um, the reduction going from three to one to two and a half to one uh, side slopes along the roadway. Um, I mentioned the granite monuments um, and uh, two, uh, two waivers that came up uh, with Steve Harding's uh, comment letter. One was underground enclosed drainage system and curbing for a road. And I think given, given the, uh, the character of, of, of Alexander Drive and the shortness of this road that uh, we would like to request those two uh, waivers. And then there were, the last uh, waiver was under resource protection permit, um, high intensity soil mapping. Uh, we have submitted a medium intensity soil map, uh, but not a high intensity soil map. And um, we've addressed uh, We've addressed all of Steve Harding's comments um, and we've made the plan changes. As I said, we met with the police chief and the um, public works director. Uh, we've addressed the DEP, the Army Corps of Engineers concerns. Um, 
And um, so I think that's, that's um, it in terms of my presentation. I would like to request one final um, item, and that is, I don't know if this is possible, but I know that Chris and Billy are, are very anxious to begin their, their home construction. Uh, they've, they've finalized the, the design of the home. They've, um, they have a contractor on board ready to go. And um, I didn't know if there was an opportunity to expedite the approval process, or approval, I should say, um, so that the carries could begin. So I'm just throwing that out there to see if there's a possibility. Okay, thank you, John. Um, the uh, next uh, thing we're going to do here is um, open the meeting to public comment. Uh, oh, sorry, Maureen. I need hosting responsibilities back. Oh, okay. Julia. Um, so I don't know uh, if anyone in the, uh, any of the pan attendees, you just bring up my attendees. Is there anybody out there who wishes to speak on the matter of the completeness of this? um application they need to raise their hand and if you're watching you just go to the bottom where it says participants and and you hover to your name and you say raise hand no one's raising their hand okay seeing none the uh public comment period is closed um so let's uh discuss the uh, matter of completeness. Um, this seems complete to me. Does anybody have anything that they think is outstanding uh, that we should, that would cause us to be deemed incomplete? I have a motion, Joe. Okay. Oh, Maureen has a finger. Uh, Maureen. Sorry about that. Um, so, I should have included in your draft motion the list of waivers for completeness, not all of the waivers that John mentioned. So if you're willing to include in your motion granting waivers for the following, um, traffic study, HHE 200, stormwater calculations, and a high intensity soil survey. And that's just for submission information. Um, that doesn't include the roadway. Yeah, those are design standards. So those you would handle as part of the final approval. Okay, got you. Um, who's making the motion? I'll make the motion, but I, Maureen, I, I didn't get a chance to jot those down. So, um, hold on a second. It was traffic. Traffic study. study H H E two hundred form. H H E two hundred or H E two hundred. It's H H E two hundred. Uh, and that's the design of the septic system. So you've got the, the the building blocks. You've got the soil surveys. You just don't have the actual design. Storm okay. water calculations. And a high intensity soil survey. Those are all wave. Those would be waiver of submission of information. Waiver of submission. Okay. Um, so motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Christopher Carey for a private road review of Magnolia Terrace and the resource protection permit to fill 3,550 square feet of RP2 wetland to construct uh, 377 feet of uh, plus or minus of private road to create frontage uh, for a new lot located at 4 Alexander Drive be complete with the waivers of submissions on uh, traffic studies HHE 200 form 
stormwater calculation and high intensity soil. Second. Uh, comment? Seeing none, Maureen, can you take a roll call vote, please? Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Pete, microphone. I'm seeing Pete? gesturing. <laughs> microphone. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take it. Uh, Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Chair Shalott? Yes, motion passes. Um, okay, so Maureen, uh, I don't think we would have needed to schedule a public hearing, correct, in order to do an expedited review? Yeah, there. to be fair, um, there are two types of applications in front of you, a private road review and a resource protection permit. Neither one of those mandate that you must hold a public hearing, however, you have received uh, correspondence from abutters regarding this application. And if you are interested in granting an approval this evening, you're also going to be um, omitting any opportunity to have a site visit. Okay. Um, all right, how do you- I would like to have a site visit. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking that too. Are we agreed on a site visit? Anybody thinks we don't need a site visit? Okay, so we're going to want a site visit, John, so we're not going to be able to do expedited review. Um, so we can schedule that at the end of our discussion. Uh, does anybody have any questions for John? None for me. Carol Ann. In, in John's uh, presentation, he mentioned sewer, and then there's uh, on-site wastewater disposal, which which is happening. I'm sorry. Say it you again. mentioned sewer when you were because there you mentioned sewer because there is sewer on isn't there available on Eastman Road, Eastman Meadows is sewer, isn't it? Yeah. Am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong. There, there is a sewer line in Eastman Road, yes. Okay. And I believe so, and you mentioned that in your presentation, and I just wanted to clarify, you don't intend to hook to sewer with that. No, that's correct. That's okay. correct. I just wanted to be clear because I heard two different things. So. Right. So. Um, the road with the Alexander Drive, do you have that? Do I have what, Joe? Is the road width, do you know the road oh, yes. width of Alexander? The road, the road width of Alexander Drive is 18 feet. So one of the justifications for making Magnolia Terrace, uh, Magnolia Drive that width is that you're just continuing the width of the existing road. Yes, the, the difference is that uh, Alexander Drive is 18 feet uh, wide of pave, pavement the travel way. Um, mm. We're proposing Magnolia Terrace to be 14 feet wide of travel way with two foot wide gravel, grass gravel shoulders on either side for a total okay. of 18. Any other questions? Andrew. Uh, yeah, sort of actually building on that, uh, one of my questions had been, I was thinking about the road width issue. It looks like the RP1 setback takes up pretty much a large portion of any space that one could construct anything in. I'm just wondering if there's any other potential house lots. Um, looks like maybe, I don't know what direction this is, maybe south of the existing house or if this is pretty much the only two lots that could exist on this. I'm just thinking, you know, we've thought in the past about road width and are, are other lots there? Do we need increased utilities or anything? I just wanted you to comment. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, we have been asked this question um, previously. And well, I, I was asked this question by 
by the client, my, my client, the carries. And I took a, um, a close look at trying to add a third lot to these, to this 10.7 acre parcel. It would be very difficult. Um, it's probably not impossible, but it would, in my mind, it would be um, very, uh, it, it would not be feasible to do. It would be um, very costly. Um, I don't know if we can, if, uh, Maureen, if you could share um, sheet three. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. You're willing to give me a moment? Yep. Okay. Okay, good. So we would have to, uh, we'd have to, first of all, extend the private road a bit more to pick up the road frontage for a potential third lot. Um, the third lot, this, this area right here is about one acre, just to give you an idea of the scale. Um, we'd be required to put 80,000 square foot um, lot size in. So uh, it would require the lot line to come right along this, um, this driveway, the existing carry driveway. It would require the lot line to go out into this area to pick up that additional acreage. So it would take away, <coughs> it would take away the, the backyard of the existing carry property. Uh, their septic system is in the backyard. Their, their water service comes in from Valley Street. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know what, what the impacts would be both on the septic system and the water service. Um, let's see, extending the road, lot area. <coughs> oh, they'd have to bring a water line in another service because what we're doing is bringing a two inch service just for this lot. So if uh, the water district requires separate services, so they'd have to bring another water service all the way in from, um, from uh, Eastman Road. And that's, you know, that's about a thousand feet. So those are some of the, those are some of the major constraints in adding a third lot. And the and you know, uh, the carries are not interested in in doing that anyways. But <clears throat> does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I mean, so it sounds like Maureen, this would probably have to come back before the planning board, regardless if it if they wanted to split it again or yes or no um so yeah andrew usually when someone comes in for a private road i tr i ask the applicant this question because i anticipate the board is going to want that answer before you process waivers and you know i think the answer is that they're really it at at most there's one more lot mm -hmm. yeah so if you I know if, <laughs> even if even if even if they could squeeze one more lot out um, Magnolia Terrace would never serve more than three lots and um, they would have to change the lot line. The, th the thing that would drive them back in front of the board is if you approve a private road of this magnitude and there's no way for them to get 125 feet of frontage out of that without extending it. If they could figure out a way to get 125 feet of frontage and chop lot one in half, they might not come back before the board. But again, the, the maximum would be one more lot. Okay, thanks. Um, I, you know, people have done more with less, so I, 
my point is if as long as people are happy, you know, fine with, I mean, yeah, one more lot is on a, I mean, we have approved other 14 foot road widths. Um, I'm just trying to think ahead like we always do. Um, it doesn't bother me terribly. I just wanted to make sure we're dotting eyes. Any other questions? All right, let's uh, find a time for a site visit. When's the submission for the December meeting deadline? Um, that would be November 30th. Yeah. So we should try to do it within the next week. Mm. Or or faster. <laughs> hey, I'm free Thursday. <laughs> and uh, we got to do it earlier. It's yeah. a little dark by like four fifteen. So Thursday is the 19th? Yes. Not available Thursday. A week Thursday. from Thursday. Uh, well, well, a week from yeah. Thursday would be the 26th. <laughs> well, I could do it in the morning. Well, that's Thanksgiving Day. You don't want to spend Thanksgiving to do. with us, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> no, could we do it this Thursday morning? I could, yeah. But depending on what time. John, can you do it? Um, the only thing I have is an eight o'clock, um, but I can do it, you know, from nine on. I can't do it then. Thursday morning's not good. I know this would be probably not great to bring Maureen back or somebody else back on a Saturday, but we do have more light then, and it is the weekend. Um, How about Friday? I've done weekends, Andrew. I appreciate the thought. Um, Friday is the 20th. Friday morning. Yeah. Eight. It's okay with me. I will, I will make whatever work for everybody else work. I can't do Friday thanks. morning. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, I can't do 10 o'clock on Friday, 10 to 11. Friday end of the day? Yes. Four, four o'clock? Four yeah. o'clock. No, yeah. it's too dark. Can't. It's too it's dark, dark at four? Yeah. What three o'clock. Can you do, Jonathan, can you do three? I can do three o'clock on Friday. Yeah, so can I. So can I. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. Three o'clock Friday. Um, so we'll want to see what's, I guess we'll want to see, uh, the, uh, new property line. Oh, that reminds me, John, uh, what about this issue of the surveys that, uh, yeah, yeah, um, we, Steve Harding's um, comment was, why don't we just put the Sebago plan as a standalone plan survey without putting it on our title block? That's fine. We, we're, you know, we've already done that. So is that, that's an official survey of the lot up to date? It's an official stamped recorded okay. survey. Um, of the perimeter, yes. It's but it, just so we're clear, it's not totally up to date, but it's close because it doesn't include this little thing, does it, Joe? I mean, John. What little, little thing? Chunk out of here. Um, that is a. The plan was never amended to include that. Um, the carving out that. I yeah. I can't see it, Marine, because the the uh, photos are in the way. 
Oh, you move the, okay, move the photos over. Here, I'll just, I'll just zoom in. Oh, that funny little jog that's coming out over. Can you see it now? Yeah, right there. That's that was a, capacity. that was a land transaction that was done after the recording of, of this perimeter survey, but it was done by deed only. The plan was never amended. <coughs> so the survey that John would submit would be up to date except for this little chunk, which okay. isn't really near the air, the area of construction. Okay. And then we would remove our title block from sheet two. Okay. So you you would you might you have a note about that that says this was never recorded, but yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Right. And so, then Owen Has I mean, yeah, Owen Haskell, who is our surveyor, will be certifying all of the interior lines, the lot lines, um, the interior lot lines here, and as well as the right of way line along Magnolia Terrace. Okay. Great. Great. So we will see you Friday. Friday afternoon at three o'clock. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does someone want to make a motion? Where'd I put my mouse here? I'll make it. See it? Oh, oh, we didn't talk. Are we going to hold a public hearing? Yeah, I guess we are. Okay. Yes. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Christopher Carey for a private road review of Magnolia Terrace and a resource protection permit to fill 3,550 square feet of RP2 wetland to construct the 377 plus or minus foot uh, private road to create frontage for a new lot located at 4 Alexander Drive be tabled to the regular December 15, 2020 meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. Do we have a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, uh, Maureen, please take a roll call vote. Mr. Sarbeck? Aye. Yes. Ms. Ms. Jordan? <laughs> yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Chair Shalott? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, thank you, John and Julia. Thank, thank you. All right, folks. Any other business? What's the workshop look like for next month? Lean. I, I don't think we have anything yet. There might be one or two small projects. Oh, we do. I'm sorry. There were two items, uh, amendments, that have been referred to you by the council. One is an amendment, uh, fence amendment, to create a fence height and a fence definition. And the other amendment is to um, add parking as a permitted use in the town farm district. Okay. We is, there a, yes. is there a use of uh, releasing skunks on the property? <laughs> you know, you kid about that. Do you really want to work on it? <laughs> it's against the rules. I vote against that. <laughs> um, I'm in favor. I just want to, <laughs> that's great. Um, I just want to alert the chair that the uh, council meeting is December 14th. And I'm expecting that that's when the short term rental recommendation will be on the council agenda. And okay. They typically like to have uh, the, the head of the planning board there to kind of formally hand it off. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> Great, all right. Anybody want to make a motion here? To... Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, Maureen. Roll call, please. Mr. Bedensky. Yes, please. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. 
For sure. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Shalott. Yes. Meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye